Good day, Observation Deck viewers. As you can see quite clearly there, um, I've got Craig, otherwise socially known as Gumshoe, although I don't know why we use the word socially because he's one of the most antisocial bastards I've ever met. But there you go. And um, anyway, I'm gonna leave, for those of you who don't know who Craig is, which is Craig is from Trust asset protectors and he writes trusts for people here in the uk well anywhere in actual fact but we'll get into all that discussion as we go on so over to you craig if you'd like to say a little bit about yourself for those viewers who have no idea who you are or who your youtube channel is hi uh, well i'm craig from the youtube channel gumshoe sleuth i uh, as rob just said i do write private trusts I just basically came on here to uh, have a chat with Rob about them as he's asked me to uh, come and have a chat to you guys. Uh, can I just ask you to do one thing? Because I don't know about my viewers, but I'm getting seasick with you keep w w spinning around in that chair. It's like I'm going to puke up any minute. It looks like I'm on a ferry to the Isle of Wight doing an interview. I to fix myself. I am actually not on a ferry, but I will explain for the shadow and the lighting. I've got terrible lighting because I'm just in the process of moving. I live off grid and I'm having my office rebuilt here and it's half built at the minute. So uh, the lighting is just a little uh, allergen light just sitting there basically lighting me up. So uh, yeah, and also my signal is not too great here. So if I do cut out or freeze, Rob's going to tell me and I will uh, drop off the video feed. So you'll just have audio on me. Okay, that's brilliant. Right. So I guess the first question, um, it might be an obvious one to some viewers, but not all viewers. So what is a trust? A trust basically is uh, when you place assets within a trust, it, it puts it into the realm of uh, another entity. So you are not the owner any longer, which uh, protects your assets. You don't own anything. So Anybody wanting to discuss your assets, your property, you have nothing. The elites would live under this as uh, own nothing, control everything, which is basically what a trust is. I'm going to try and keep everything in layman's terms because trust law is immense and it can get very, very complicated. So I'll try and break it all down the very best I can so people can, can conceive what it is I'm saying and uh, it keeps the questions to the minimum from what you've just said in the, in that brief description of a trust, you've got a splitting of, um, how should we say, titles. For instance, yeah. the, the trustee would have the, uh, the title to the property, whereas the beneficiary would have the equitable title to the property. Yeah. Absolutely. They have the equitable interest to the property. And, uh, and as you say, the, uh, the trustee would hold the legal title as it is, the legal title. Right. So what are the uh, formations of a trust? Because there are, again, some people out there that don't know the positions within a trust and who can hold those positions and what they are. Well, basically, the positions within the trust are set law grantor, pretty much anything ending in OR is, is the same position. It's the set law grantor, uh, executor of the trust, however you want to use that. And you have the trustees and you have the beneficiaries. Now, um, as far as a trust's makeup is concerned, there are three main certainties of a trust, although there are technically four certainties to a trust, but the fourth isn't used very often. Uh, this certainties of intent, which is the intent to create the trust. You've got the subject matter, which are the rights, duties and properties to be subject to the trust. Mm. And you have the objects, which are the issues of the trust. And like I say, there is a fourth certainty, which isn't often used, which is the certainty of distribution of the trust assets or the trust property. Like right. I say it's not often used, um, but it is occasionally brought into play. OK, so one of the reasons that I've asked Craig on to the observation deck to discuss trust is because many of you probably already know that we either through Project Jericho or whatever, are attempting in chancery to access the CQV, which those in Project Jericho are fully aware of. Now, what are the different most common trusts that you, you come across or you create? The most common one is an express trust. Uh, it's uh, basically a trust that's created in express terms and usually by a settler in writing. You do have implied trusts, and which there are two types, constructive and resulting. 
but mainly the implied trust is imposed by a judge. Uh, a uh, resulting trust is pretty much whereby a judge is remedying a wrong party and, and giving back either to the set law, well, usually to the set law on a resulting, and uh, a constructive is usually whereby the, uh, the transfer of title or property, should I say, is going just for the beneficial interest only to somebody, which a judge is usually imposing. Is that usually because, um, like, if you've got an implied trust, it was either by writing or the actions of another who didn't actually know that mm -hmm. we're making a trust, so the judge has got a pull judgment on it to say, well, what are the factors here, and can we look at that as a trust? Absolutely. Either, either there was uh, not, not knowing that there was creating a trust, or it was a bad trust that's gone into court for a judge to make decision on. You you mentioned about the um, the criteria, the, the three main criteria that a trust has to have in order to be classed as a trust. Does the word trust have to be in the text itself? Or again, by its implication, by implied, it's an expressed trust by what's actually written. It doesn't actually need to say the word trust. Not, not everything has to use the word trust when you think of life in general everything literally everything you do is a trust if i for instance asked you to look after this we've just entered into a trust this is the res so the trust can come in many many forms and and not always like you say not always uh, actually being expressed not always being uh, known that a trust is being created but everything we do in life is actually a trust so, but as long as we've, we, we can literally tick those three boxes of the three certainties of a trust, it's a trust. Absolutely. It doesn't need the fourth certainty to be a trust, but those three are absolute. If one of those are missing, it is not a trust. So is this why in the court of equity then it's so important? Because if you, if, if you look at it and you, as you just said, if you do any transaction and somebody retains something for any amount of time for that moment of transaction and there's an asset between the two people, then there's a trust that's been formed. Absolutely. Yes. Right. So therefore, every contract is a trust or am I missing something? Every con everything we do in, in life is a trust. So, yes, every contract is a trust. There is a trust relationship at play always. Ah, well, I know there's a trust relationship. But could it stand up in court that every contract is a trust? I'll, I'll give you an example so, so you know where my head's going here. The local gas board or the water board agree to supply you with a utility. Yes. Right. So the the set, uh, sorry, the trustee is the utility provider. The asset is whatever the utility is. And the beneficiary is the one receiving the asset. Absolutely. Right. So then answer me this. And I know you might think I'm trying to ambush you here, but I'm not. Uh, but it's just occurred to me. Right. Well, if we've established those positions in the trust and they are as fact, how can the beneficiary be in debt? The beneficiary is never in debt. You're not the debt. You're only, you're only going into debt because you don't know what's at play. Now, if you don't know what's at play, then they, the system will absolutely walk all over you. We, we see this in every, every aspect of what they do. Uh, so if the, um, but so you take. Judge Let's for instance make... say the gas board, like the, the utility supplier, whoever it might be, they are then they are the trustee. Now we already established that the asset in question is whatever is being supplied, and we are the beneficiary of that supply. So under yeah. trust law, the beneficiary can't be a debtor because all debts and liabilities, he doesn't own those titles, he owns the equitable interest. So the trustee has to take care of those debts. Is that correct? The trustee is responsible for all these debts. And this is I mean, when you look at utilities, for instance, in the past, you used to get a paper bill. Now, you look at those paper bills, and there's many people made many YouTube videos on these on these sort of, of things. But the old paper bill was actually a check. You was never actually sent a bill. Anybody who was, who was looking at it, if you ask for a true bill with a sum certain, you could never, ever receive it. It couldn't be done. They, they never have sent one ever to anybody. No, and, and this is why I was trying to make the point in this line of question about trusts themselves, because um, we're just using utilities as an example, but it could be any contract for a supply of something or goods. But it doesn't matter. But the point I'm trying to make is that if the three criteria have met on a contractual basis between a supplier of some description, the asset itself, and who is to receive that asset, 
under trust law, not Consumer Credit Act or anything else like that, if you've established those three criteria from a supplier of any description, surely you can then use trust law rather than the lower administration laws of the Consumer Credit Act. Yes, certainly. And with it, <coughs> excuse me, with it then coming under trust law, you can then take it into Chancery Court, which is one of the highest courts of the land, and you can bring it under a trust under a trust relationship, which is basically what Chancery Court is there for, for settling trust. Uh, and it's a perfect, perfect storm in effect, because they cannot in equity find against you. Well, not if it's established that you are you, you are the beneficiary. You received. <laughs> you, therefore, you must be the beneficiary. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Trust law. <laughs> so in what area of trust law can the trustee demand money from the beneficiary and not the other way around? Is there anything in trust law that would allow that to, to happen? Well, not from the beneficiary per se, from the trust. A trustee can, can demand money from the trust when for their services, in effect, because nobody works for free. Okay, so I, I, trustee, I, I, I appreciate he, there's, a, there's an admin cost here. That, 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 yeah, they're allowed a fee for managing the trust. And that's that's no point. No, it's, it's it's a breach of trust law if if the trustee starts dipping in and helping himself to the trust property and assets. It's it's a breach of trust law. Right? Would you say that if somebody supplies you something, then they have a fiduciary duty? They do. Would that? I mean, that that applies to either a physical goods or a service of any description. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So the, the in principle, okay, so let me put it to you this, because we spoke a little bit before you, you came on the channel and I, I mooted this idea about the brainwashing labels that we're given. And since we're talking about trust, we obviously know in the news at the moment that I think up to this moment in time that we're recording, 12 senior ministers have now jumped ship over the last 12 hours, right? And you, you, I mean, we know it's all theatre, and nothing's going to change. But anyway, but that's what's happened. Let's just leave it at that. All right. now. So <laughs> we're told that uh, the ministers this or the cabinet that and all the rest of it. But here's my take. And correct me if I'm wrong here and my basic look at the world. If I remove all of those media labor filters, the cabinet or go the government. But let's just stick to the cabinet at the moment. All right. If we move, if we remove the word cabinet and replace it with its correct factual observation in law, surely that's a board of trustees, is it not? It certainly is. So, and again, correct me if I'm wrong. If it's a board of trustees, they can't be the beneficiaries. Or, well, actually, no. Let me get that right. I know I read trust laws. A trustee can be a beneficiary, provided there is more than one beneficiary. Otherwise, there'd be no need for a trust because it's his property. But they, the uh, the trustees in the case of the government mm. cannot be beneficiary. They're there for for our benefit. We are. Uh, the yeah, yeah, I, I agree. But if we if we were to keep this on pure trust law, he can be the trustee and the beneficiary because he's also a member of the UK. Well, technically, he is a beneficiary in that in that capacity when yes. he's at home and he's not sitting in that exactly. And his bins collected and he's getting his electricity, although they don't pay for that sort of thing, like uh, no, the like the payers. great unwashers yes. they uh, or would. Yeah. So, so when we write to our MP, we seem to be taking a very subservient attitude or approach. When in actual fact, we're talking to the local trustee. Yes, we should be compelling them, not begging them. Because we are the beneficiary. Yeah, you give them instructions. Right. So we've covered utilities, contracts, suppliers, and it's all trust. Every contract is a trust of one form or another, whether it's expressed or implied. The beneficiary is well within their rights to hold trustee accountable for doing or not doing certain things that the beneficiary demand be done. It pains me that they don't as a general rule. Yes, absolutely. They should be on them to account under trust law. Apart from all the acts, statutes and legislation, which is administrative laws or the law of Rome, that means the only real law that's left is the law of contracts and equity. Is that correct? Trust law. Yes. 
which makes that the supreme man-made law. Now, I, I, I make that distinction between the supreme man-made law, although it's, I should take the word supreme in the way, but man-made law. But man-made law, obviously, we get on to the subject of trust, still staying on trust. But yeah, sorry about that, folks. We just had a little bit of an IT glitch because of a, a bad connection, one, one end or the other. But hey, so uh, Craig's taken his video off, and but we've still got it on audio. And hopefully by now that you're looking, um, I would have put... Uh, an image or a logo up there so but it's what he what he's saying not, not what he looks like because if you went on that then you, you wouldn't be even looking at him would you nah. sorry what we're going to do now is uh so the highest law of the land craig trust law um yeah. now we can begin to understand why because everything is either expressed or implied trust in terms of any contractual agreement is that correct absolutely and so, trust law by equity right so yeah, what I was saying was that so all act statutes legislation, all this administrative law is kind of like the, the silt at the bottom of the river and the clear water is actually equity, because if everything is trust. Then all you ever need to deal with a problem is the fiduciary duty of the trustee establishing your role and position as the beneficiary. That's absolutely right. Yes. So that simplifies an awful lot of laws then, doesn't it? It kind of knocks out the ballpark. Uh, most of what they would call the system they would call yeah. law used against us. Distraction, deception. But in effect, it's always by consent, one way or the other. We don't always know we are consenting to it. But it's like the old adage. If you had a £10 note in your hand and I told you I was going to take that £10 note, you didn't object and I took that ten pound note, you did nothing to stop me. Have I actually taken anything from you? That was you consenting through your acquiescence. So yeah. you have you have no right to recourse. In the same way as people consent by acquiescence to their administrative laws, as they would call them, which they're not. Um, but once you have consented to it by your acquiescence, it now becomes a right of theirs to take what they're taking. So it become yeah it becomes truth in law. So so all right. So we've dealt with like basically the service industry contracts and all the rest of it. And then I just want to notch it up a little bit by saying, well, let's get back to it's not the cabinet; it's a board of trustees. So using trust law to compel as the beneficiary a trustee to act in a certain manner is absolutely black and white trust law. It's absolutely black and white trust law. Now, the the trustee in, in the government's case will usually ignore that. And the reason being is quite simple. Nobody holds them to account or very, very few hold them to account. So they've got to, to get in away with it. Now, if people started holding them to account, they would no longer be able to get away with it in the manner that they do. Well, it's funny you should use the word account as well, because I was reading the other day about uh, certain trust laws and fiduciary duties of the trustees. And it quite clearly states that uh, as the beneficiary, that would be us. We can ask the trustee for the accounts, can't we? Or at least a, a look at a certain amount of them. Require of them. Require of them. Yes. It's so say, for instance, somebody got a demand from uh, HMRC. Just just hypothetically, OK, they got a demand from HMRC. Now, you've already established your status, your, your religious beliefs, absolutely everything. And um, you whether you've got evidence for it or not, if it's coming out of your mouth and you've sworn it on your own Bible and we'll come to Bible in a little while. But effectively, what you've done is you've reestablished your position as the beneficiary and you've instructed the trustee. In this case, it would be the board of trustees known as the government. Yeah. Yeah. So if they were to ignore you, the be if they were to ignore the beneficiary's instructions to a trustee under trust law, what sort of consequences could they be looking at? Well, ultimately, they should be going to prison for an awful long time. That would be the, the consequences that they would normally, if it was me or you doing that, would yeah. receive. Um, in actual fact, what the consequences that they would really get is shuffled into a different position. Yeah. 
we know that but at least you've got a, but then you would have a claim to bring against whomever it is you compelled to act in a certain way as long as that com as long as what you were compelling them to do or ordering them to do as a trustee was within the remit of the trustee yes it, it has to be within that remit but yeah. otherwise yes they would be in trust law so here's my layman's take on on it right now as as i mentioned earlier i i did a video and for those of you who haven't seen it yet on the divine trust i think i uploaded it maybe two or three weeks ago have a look in my back catalog on my video page of this channel and please please have a look at the divine trust if you haven't already done so because there is some critical important information in there now i bring that up not just obviously to promote that video but for a very good reason and that is from what you said at the beginning on the different types of trust, the book of Genesis, chapters 1 to 29, is given what's written, is an express trust. trust. Absolutely, it's written. And now let's jump back over to the CQV Act 1666, which a lot of my viewers will be familiar with. And if you're not, put that in Google and go check it out for yourselves. Now, so we've got the express trust in the book of Genesis. Now we've got the CQV Act 1666, which is what I would call an implied trust. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. It's the uh, the actual uh, terms are not written by the set law within the 1666, Setake, Seskavi, however you wish to call it. Yeah. So purely on, again, we're going to stick firmly to trust law here. So we've got an express trust that gives natural uh immunity as it were to administration law that's perfect actually um <clears throat> yeah so we've got natural immunity from the express trust in the book of genesis chapters 1 to 29 i think it is but chapter 24 sorry paragraph 24 uh, is, is is the one where we've got dominion over everything and then you've got the cqv 1666 which is legislation as we know but that doesn't move correct me if i'm wrong here craig that doesn't move the positions already established through the divine law or natural law in the trust, does it? The CQV doesn't actually move any positions within the trust. Nothing whatsoever, no. So therefore, then, legislation itself in the form of the CQV and the 1707 later is reflecting natural law and making the crown or the board of trustees in the government, the trustees, I mean, no one's argued that in the CQV because it actually says in there, we will hold your property until X, Y, Z. Well, in other words, then they've admitted that they are taking on a trust role because you mentioned earlier that whoever's holding the assets is in a trust position. Absolutely. Right. So if they've said in the CQV that we are holding your property until such time as you come back and tell us that you're not dead, effectively, they are then by those very words, confirming that they are, in fact, trustees of said property. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, and by very nature, you tell them that you're alive, they would like to ignore that. And you would have to pry your, your sesquivy from their dead fingers. <laughs> As it exactly. is. But I just want the viewers to get an idea of, of, of where we're coming from here. And... Yes. and once you figure out very quickly of how simple it really is when you boil all of the peripheral stuff for the administration courts, you get rid of them. To be honest with you, the only CPR rules that you need to be concerned yourself with if you took the, that kind of route would be procedural, nothing more. And you wouldn't even have to quote any laws because, well, you are quoting, you're quoting their laws, which separates you as the, the natural divine beneficiary from the man-made administration laws, which includes technically the civil procedure rules, but they won't let you in the door unless you follow those. So there you go. All in all, would you say that, for instance, council tax, let's take council tax. I know that's big on people's mind. And if you haven't already done so, folks, buy my book on council tax on Guy Uni, link below. But let's take council tax. If we take that as the utility side of things that we discussed earlier, the council are saying you give us this money, we will provide you these goods or services. So we now have, again, a perfect mimicry of an implied trust. Is that correct? 
Yes, um, and when you think of it, they have the obligation in the first place to provide you with that which you require. So uh, again, a distraction and deception to, uh, to to pilfer the trust as it is. Right. So, Craig, are you aware with the, the separation of the executive, parliament, the church, and, and, and so on? You know, the, under a true democracy, there has to be a separation of powers, yes? We do at the minute. We're clinging on to it with, our, with the skin of our teeth, aren't we? Right. So <clears throat> the executive, for, for the viewers who don't realise, is two, two of these pillars, two very important pillars. Well, they're all important, but the executive are the ones, i.e. parliament, they make the law, Yes. Yes. Right. And then one of the other major pillars, obviously, of a democracy is the judiciary. Which should now, be very, very separate, shouldn't it? Absolutely. So here's here's what I'm thinking. And perhaps I'll get your take on it, because we were talking about obviously everything is a trust. Everything is a contract. Um, and we're still on the subject of council tax. Don't worry for all you people on council tax. And I know there's lots of stuff out there on council tax, but I'm just trying to simplify it from this perspective. The councils are clearly the trustees and you are the beneficiary and this separation, which is in the British Constitution as well. Um, and it's also in the Local Government Act 1888, section 70, uh, paragraph 74, section C. And it's there to maintain the separation of powers, which it actually says, and I'm paraphrasing here, um, no local authority or council can act in a judicial capacity. In other words, what and correct me if I'm wrong here, if it is acting in a judicial capacity, it's breaking that law which has not been repealed. And it breaks that separation of powers because is not the local government, i.e. council, the executive? Is that correct? Yes. And ergo, the judiciary then, then has to be separated from the executive. Yes. So how come they're writing liability orders, which is a judicial act against yeah, the Local yeah. Government Act 1888? And I know they quote the Local Finances Act and all the other bullshit, but Local Government Act, which precedes that and hasn't been repealed, quite clearly states you will not act and cannot act in a judicial nature. In other words, you can't print your own liability orders because on this separation of powers alone, they've already broken the constitutional law of the United Kingdom. Is that correct? Yes, it is now. Well, when you think about it, if uh, we are all equal at law, so if they have the right to write their own uh, liability orders, so do I, so do you, so does everybody else in here, which obviously we don't. So clearly they don't either. So when you start... I, th I think... Yeah, go on. Sorry, I think m most folks know that uh, they don't have the right to do this, but they don't know how to hold them to account on that and that. But as you say, the Local Government Act 1888 does just that. Once I started looking at the world in uh, with the framework or the filter, as it were, of everything being a trust, it was almost like the fog cleared quickly. And I didn't have to worry myself about all of these specific laws. The only thing I really look for nowadays is uh, case law against the opposition or something that a Supreme Court judge said or somebody learned because it's still just as valid. That's all I really look for. Because if you stick to this trust relationship and the fact that you are always the beneficiary, then surely the only thing that you need to look at is the basics of trust law. Yeah, when you look at it, trust law is immense and it's very, very complicated. But when you break it down to how they act with us, it becomes very simple, especially when your mind's working on the right realm. It's, yeah. uh, it can get very, very confusing. But once somebody, it was you that actually came to me, you're really, really good at pulling out these, uh, this legislation against them. And when you came to me and said, check out uh, the Local Government Act 1788, Section 78, Subsection 2, I believe it was. Yeah. And, and eight, I had eight, a look at... 1888, Craig. 1788. 1788. Yeah. It, was, it was 1888, Local Government Act 1888, Section... What was it? 79, Subsection C. I'll, I'll put it up on the screen. I'll find it for you, folks. Don't worry about it. I'll put it over on the screen and you can see it for yourself. And I'll leave a link in the description below. And then you can just simply be very polite and honourable and continue to pay your council tax. Do not become a defendant. And 
Ask them the simple question. Does your local government finance act supersede the fact that you can't act in a judicial capacity and you're putting both the executive and the judicial together, which is against the British Constitution? And you can look at the Bill of Rights Act as well. So uh, all the rest of that kind of stuff. But it's it's a lot more simple than doing months and months and months of fighting and and digging out this, that and the other. And I'm not just talking about council tax here, but th that should that trust approach work for everyone and everything yeah absolutely it should work for everybody and everything as long as it is done correctly and this is what's uh, what's missing a lot of the time because there's so many people telling people so many different ways of doing things that they uh, they're making mistakes usually because they're listening to the uh, the wrong ones there's a lot of them out there uh, a lot of the time the people who are, who are teaching the wrong thing aren't actually trying to teach the wrong thing. Obviously, you have the shields out there that are controlled opposition, but yeah. a lot of the time as well, it's people with good intent that are listening to these shields and controlled opposition and then go and make a video themselves because they're addicted to the likes and, uh, and shares the uh, accolades of it all, which yeah. is uh, unfortunate because it isn't uh really the way to go forward. Well, no, this is why I think uh, it was last year when um i put a video up on on the beginning of the jericho project and the whole jericho project is based around trust laws but it the the, the, de the declaration itself which forms part of the jericho public pack now is the, the establishment of this beneficiary's position to such an extent that it can't be argued with and you simply instruct the trustee which is exactly what most, as we say, most uh, contracts are, but more importantly, in this instance, the CQV could be if you approach the whole thing correctly. How many people are asking for something as opposed to compelling? And, and that's where you, uh, you, don't, you don't ask, you inform them of what you require. I think there's also, uh, because of the brainwashing over centuries and centuries, there is this innate anchor psychological anchor in there that we're so used to asking and we're a bit and and fear creeps in when we compel move the court or demand it's just like oh my god that's really bad manners it's like no you I, i've heard parliament and i've heard judges and everybody else and they all talk in in actual matter of fact which mm -hmm. is which is what i think uh anyone who seeks remedy for whatever reason has to start understanding in their own psychology that you are in charge, but you don't need to have the arrogance that goes with it, whether it be on paper or, or, or verbally. If you're comfortable in your own skin, then you should be a nice individual. You know, if that makes sense. That to me is the, is, is the mentality of sovereign rather than I'm a sovereign and you will do this. I mean, there's a certain tone to everybody's approach and that tone reflects I don't know anything, uh, the, the vibration or the frequency of, of, of that individual. So I guess what I'm saying is that, that being a sovereign or a sovereign being or a living, whatever, whatever title you want to put on, on yourself under natural law, whatever that might be for you, it, it's not just a title. It's not a label. It's a way of life. It's, it's a, a vibration. It's a spiritual feeling. It's how you live your life that you're comfortable in your own skin and you know who you are, which makes it easier for you to stand your ground. Because if people say, oh, I'm a bit too nervous about standing my ground, what they're actually saying is you operate, you're still operating in fear. Exactly. And why are you fearing the truth? Because it's so brainwashed into our minds that that's what we've been, that's what we've been mind controlled to do is literally fear the truth that we are beneficiaries and we don't scared, don't want to do that, whatever. It's all based on fear. You were going to say something, Craig, sorry. So confidence doesn't have to be attitude. And this is where a lot of people get that mixed up. Um, no, it, it's, it's common knowledge that confidence is a, a, a sexy uh, trait that people have and people find confidence sexy. They don't find attitude sexy. So, so when you're, you're requiring something of, of the, uh, the trustees or demanding of, of the trustees, you don't have to come across with that attitude. You don't have to come across as sexy either. <laughs> yeah. But that you is, do have to 
confident. If you're not confident at all, they will walk all over you. So as far as I'm concerned, we've covered quite a lot of ground from the perspective of a, of a trust. So it, it sort of behoves me to get to the point then of, so how does one go about protecting their assets and naming their own beneficiaries and et cetera, et cetera, doing all that stuff um, with trust asset protectors? How, how difficult is the process? The process is very, very easy. Uh, you drop me a line. We will uh, work out exactly how to go forward from there. Um, but basically, it starts with a call. There is a fee to these calls, but the call, the fee does come back to you and it's knocked off the fee of the trust. But that's purely and simply because every man and his dog wants a call with me. So if I didn't put a fee on it, I would be constantly talking on the telephone and wouldn't be able to get to the folks that actually want to get a truck. We'll, on the, on the call that we have, we'll have a Zoom call and we'll go through all of the ins and outs of it. And usually your trust is, is delivered to you within one week. People come to me for advice on trust that other people have written because generally what they've done, they've got to trust themselves and then just started selling it out themselves and they don't actually know how to advise on it and how to discuss it. So what they, what they generally do is give people a blank sort of a trust, which wouldn't actually be a complete trust because there is no res in the trust. There's no object, uh, uh, no property within the trust. And, and at that stage, people don't actually know how to put anything in the trust or they have to go back and pay somebody again to put something in the trust, whereby mine is very, very simple and you can... Uh, you can uh, affect the trust yourself you can well folks that sounds like a brilliant deal i know that other people have been having problems i don't like naming names but they've been having a few glitches and challenges with creating trust with other people uh through lack of communication mainly not not anything else nothing nefarious but uh, and one of the other one of the other issues i think a lot of people uh, had that I know of, the, the, the trust itself was obviously didn't meet the three criteria in certain aspects, but obviously yours yours do. But it's getting a trust account. Now, Craig, correct me if I'm wrong in here. When In the early days when I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'd phone up Barclays. And now I know some people say Barclays do a trust account and there's one line and, and, and whatever in the bank. But then I had this conversation with someone and as if we were overcomplicating it ourselves. And they simply said, well, you just simply open a bank account in your name but you only ever use the trust accounts in it, ergo, it's a trust account. Is, is, is it that simple? Absolutely. Yes, yes. And I talk every anybody wanting to open a trust account or banks don't want to actually open trust accounts anymore. So it is, it is the best way to go forward for a trust account is to own it up in your name as trustee and place it within the trust. And then it is actually a trust account. Right. So it really is as simple as opening a brand new bank account, only using trust accounts within that trust and then linking that to the trust any way you like. I mean, I know the banks actually say, oh, no, we don't take trust accounts without like this. But a trust account can be a bloody current account. It doesn't need to be a specific trust account that the bank call a trust account. It's just an account that's not used for anything else. Is that correct? Absolutely. And then it's only used for trust, trust business moving forward. And it's a trust account. Well, so that goes over that hurdle that people were having earlier. Craig, is there anything else that you want to add to our discussion? I mean, I think we've covered a lot. And if people were actually paying, and I'm sure you were, attention, there's a lot of important information that Craig and I have just bounced around with each other. And uh, you might want to go back over it and make some notes. It's entirely up to you. But Craig, is there anything that you want to add from your perspective, and obviously I'll leave a link in the description below to trust asset protectors. If anybody interested in forming a trust for you or your family to protect your property, you can get in touch with Craig direct. So uh, is there anything you want to add? As you say, we've covered quite a lot. It's uh, a bit like one of my videos, really. We've got to bounce, bounce it around, bounce around the room and, uh, and it hit on. And then it's a, it's a great way of doing it because we cover a little bit of everything. And if anybody wants any any specifics, they can drop me a line at info at trustassetprotectors.com and we can uh, have a chat from there. Brilliant. Okay, I'll leave a link in the description to all the relevant uh, bits that you've got, Craig, as well as my usual links. I hope you've actually enjoyed this episode. I want to thank Craig, otherwise known as Gumshoe Sleuth, and I'll again leave his YouTube channel in the link below. Go over there and... Uh, and uh, I'll see you guys very soon. So as always, question everything, believe nothing, and stay curious. And I'll see you on deck.
very soon.